This episode of the Linux Action Show is brought to you by the good-looking folks at GoDaddy.com. Use our code Linux and save yourself some cash. Welcome to the Linux Action Show, Season 23, Episode 4. My name is Chris. And my name is Matt. Hey there, Matt. How you doing? I'm doing good. Episode 224. Already? We, I know. It's nuts. Wow. It, it seems like Episode 200 was just a couple of weeks ago. And man, do we have a big show. Huge. Really big Huge. show. Uh, I'll tell you all about it. But before we get to that, let me show you my runs Linux this week. It's a little bit of a stretch because it's Android, but mm. this Nikon Coolpix S800C will be an Android-powered point-and-shoot camera for around 350 U.S. dollars. 350. Now yeah, this is an interesting yeah. concept because it's a full. It's supposedly going to be a full-fledged Android system, uh, you know, attached to the 16 megapixel point-and-shoot uh, CMOS sensor, and it's going to be able to do 1080p video. It's going to have an OLED uh, touchscreen. Uh, it's going to supposedly have Wi-Fi in there, and then I, I would think you could run apps on there to. like Instagram and Google Plus and Facebook and Twitter, and you could, you know, take th theoretically a high-resolution photo and then submit it to one of your favorite places well, right then and there on the camera. That seems neat. Well, here's the deal. Uh -oh. So basically, <laughs> I I opened up this discussion on my Google Plus page here. I think it was a couple days ago. We had a really good debate as to the value of this and whether or not this is something people are going to adopt. And the common thought was that why would you do this? We have smartphones. Okay. Okay. I'm going to take a step back and point out I have a smartphone. However, I don't use it as an MP3 player. I think that's just not something I'm interested in. Okay. I use a dedicated MP3 player. So is it such a stretch that people out there might want the advantage of a camera with better, frankly, well, optical so zoom? I'll tell you what. You so, know, my wife you know. Uh, My wife prefers the iPhone. She has an iPhone 4. Yeah, and, you know, that's considered to have a good camera. And I would say yeah, it does that's have that's what a, I have. It has, has a great a, camera. It has yeah. a pretty good camera. Uh, she still opts to carry on her at all times her point and shoot. For exactly. pictures of the kids because exactly. not only is it still a far superior camera just on its Thank own, you. but it's also uh, faster. Like, you know, yep. it fires faster. It it has dedicated storage. It has dedicated buttons and functions just for taking pictures. Well, and your focus is cleaner. And and digital zoom and optical zoom are co two completely different things. Right. And oh, big time. And so, frankly, I don't care. I mean, a Coolpix is going to have a better zoom option than a phone so it it's also going to have uh, integrated gps so you can do yeah. location tagging for those types of and things. if they have android built into this that's where it gets interesting then all of a sudden you can do a lot of your tweaking right there on your camera so you're not right having to, i mean there's literally photo editors on there see what exactly. i don't like though and and this is just the style of camera is yeah i would still prefer to have some manual control like a flash button or something see it's only android oh, buttons right. on the back of right, it right right but we you know yeah. you are you are talking uh, a lot of power. I mean, I've yeah. often thought, because what my wife does is she takes pictures, mm -hmm. and then I have her hooked up with a little I -fi, Wi Fi card. Okay. So sure. she can do that. But she still actually prefers just to get home, pull out the yeah. uh, SD card, and drag them on her machine. And she, then you know what she does immediately? She posts like her favorite ones onto Facebook, mm -hmm. some on another mm -hmm. network. And she, you know, does that all the time. That's her workflow. So if she could do that from her camera. Well, it'll be interesting to see if that bridge is over, because as another person in my uh, Google Plus thread pointed out, they said, for people that want a traditional camera, this may not be the answer for them. They may still want to, as you said, take the <clears throat> take the card out and do everything from home. Yeah, and as Metal Freak so. points out in our JBLive.tv chat room, we do this show live 10 a.m. on Sundays. Mm -hmm. That's 10 a.m. Pacific. He says, does it run the Android market? You oh, know, that's important. I think that's critical. Yeah, or is it going to be some sort of lockdown embedded thing? You know, you know like, but the fact that you could yeah. get, you, even then, you could you could likely still get the Amazon store, which is pretty good. Yeah. Uh, it's I not bad. I don't know though. <sighs> is it worth three fifty? It's still got to no, be the key like... thing for this. Is it's got to have decent battery life. Yeah. yeah uh, it's going to be Android two three. That's usable if it's if you're using yeah. this as a camera and Android's more of just a, a mechanism to. It would have to be. Yeah. yeah you're not, not going to be browsing, browsing the web on your right, camera. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So Android two three might be acceptable. Mm -hmm. Um. So if it's if it's all of if it's if it's still a very good point and shoot with good optics and fast response. I think it might actually be a contender. Could be, could be, and I and I also get that they're trying to not go the way of Kodak. Uh, they're not trying to, you know, they're not trying to become that uh, right. obsolete I mean, thing. So talking, I, I understand, and it. we're talking I, Nikon, I yeah, right. I mean, Nikon's got a decent name. Oh no, yeah, I'm my my wife's a photographer, and she rocks a Nikon. Yeah, I mean, she. Yeah, <laughs> she's all about that. So, um, but you know, she also and she also has a cool picks, but for her, it's a toy. This it's just could something make an to point interesting. Click. You know, yeah. at three hundred fifty dollars, it's a, it'd yeah. be a little high for my for my budget. 
but yeah, it we could wouldn't be do it. Yeah. definitely something to worth watching the reviews on, mm-hmm. and then you know maybe a, maybe for a Christmas thing. I don't know. Could be, could yeah. be if the, if this is someone that's familiar with Android and yeah. likes a point and shoot, this could yeah. be a great match. All right, Matt. Well, cool. we we do have a really big show coming up today, so Alrighty. we are going to review Backtrack Linux. Uh, there's Ooh, a new yeah. release that came out, version five R three, and uh, came out uh, a couple of weeks ago. And I've been wanting to go on. I've been wanting for years to review this on the show. So I uh, I went a little overboard. Not only we're going to talk about backtrack, <laughs> but uh, I'm also good. going to do a assuming everything works. Yeah, because it's, it's going to be live a live remote compromise of a system, and I'm going to get shell access using some of the tools Ooh. on the backtrack live CD. Oh, that could so, be cool. Yeah, that yeah. should be fun. Also, uh, we're going to bring a special guest on later we on, are. aren't we? Tell we us a little are. bit about that. For those of you that follow the subreddit, you may be familiar with uh, Ken Starks and his uh, situation with uh, c- um, dealing with a uh, cancer. Yeah, and there was a fundraiser that, that was held for him online. And Ken uh, Starks is—he's a big deal. Yeah. Um, if you are ever been to the—and uh, I'm probably going to butcher is, the name, but you basically put the uh, site up here. It's blog of Hel- uh, Helios, I believe, or he- yeah, Helios, yeah. I believe. I, I never pronounce that right. And he's been well known for for huge uh, contributor to the community. Um, has worked with kids getting. Uh, g- Getting them set up, underprivileged kids that don't have access to computers, getting them hooked up with computers, yeah. running yeah. Linux, things of that sort. He, um, just He's, tremendous, tremendous uh, support to the community. So, you know, the community rallied behind him and got yeah. together and helped him to get the funds he needs. It sounds like to, it may have uh, developed get, into a, we're, you know, and not everything's finished yet, but it could be a very, very much so a success story in terms of I community so. rallying around this. So I've never seen anything like it. It was, it just, it just exploded. I mean, so uh, yeah. we're going to be chatting cool. with uh, one of the folks who's been working. Yes. on this and I'll get you the story behind that and really how the community yep. may have been a exactly. massive help here. Yeah, this is the so. person that actually ran the campaign yep. to help him uh, get funded. Not to mention so. we're going to cover the news from this week including some big changes coming to Arch Linux and mm-hmm. then at the end of the show we've got emails from you mm-hmm. and uh, we'll get to those. But before we do all of that I want to say good morning to the fine folks at GoDaddy who are sponsoring this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. Nice. And GoDaddy is running a promotion for the month of August. Well, if you can believe it, August is almost over. It's almost over. It's almost September. I mean, just, just. Ugh. I mean, I feel bad for the kids out there. Yeah, I'm sorry. You're just going you guys. back to school, kids. <laughs> yeah, that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. So if you want to, you know, just uh, go like a one last hurrah. Go grab dad's credit. No, I'm kidding. Don't do that. Yeah, but no. if you want to get a great domain at a great price, go use our 20% off deal because it ends in August. Use the code go twenty off six. Go twenty off. Six. When you check out, you get twenty percent off whatever you want—a domain name, some hosting, a renewal. If you got a bunch of renewals, get them done with this code while you can. Now is the time to do it. This is a good savings on that kind of thing. And uh, go over to GoDaddy.com and uh, grab that because you know what? They support this show for years now, and you support us by supporting them. And also. If you get this show after August, we still have our old standby, the code Linux, when you check out to save 10% off. Exactly. Always consider that. All right. Thank you, GoDaddy. All right, Matt, we've got a few picks to burn through here at the top of the show. All righty, then. The first one is my Android app, this pick, and I've been sitting on this one for a little while, waiting a spot for it to open up, and I think this is the week to feature it. All right. And, uh, you know... A lot of Android apps go the route of ad supported for uh, monetizing, do. right? They do. Sometimes some of these ad networks are not as reputable as the other. And kind of like on a PC, they can leave junk behind on your Android. They can. That gets messy. One of the sites I love and talk about a lot on this show is AppBrain. It's a fantastic way to find apps for Android that's much cleaner than the Play Market, which is honestly, to me, doesn't really feel like they care about selling apps as much as they care about selling music and videos and stuff. So AppBrain's a great website for doing that. They've got their own app uh, repository that's, you know, indexes nice. the Google one and they have got a bunch of great apps that kind of are built around the site that add value to it. And one of them is this free app they're putting out called App Brain Ad Detector. Oh, okay. And what does this do? It goes through and it scans the apps and it verifies the ad networks they use against a known database that AppBrain has collected because they do have this massive index of all these apps and all these valid apps and all these apps that mm-hmm. get bad you know, reports and have you know, malware found and things like that. And so they've essentially built this huge database they can check against and you run the scan against your installed applications. It detects over 70 different types of uh, different types of um, triggers like maybe apps that do annoying push notifications, oh, this like is you nice. know you install something and all of a sudden you start getting spam in so your it helps notification vet tray. The applications yes. before you ever install them, so and that you make sure you know what you're getting into. And I if like you've got that. one of those right. spammy apps that 
it wants to run in the background and remind you about new coins or something Nagware, like that. Yeah, right. it, it'll mm-hmm. nuke that stuff. Oh, yeah. Oh. So it's a oh, great, it's, cool. and it's free too. It's got great reviews. So uh, to understand this, it not only will alert you to these concerns, it will in some cases address many of these concerns yeah, for you and yeah. allow you to still install the software. Yeah, that's cool. Um, now uh, it also has uh, it also has support for uh, finding stuff that might just be bogus. But uh, overall, I, hmm. I really have. Uh, I actually ran this. I didn't really have any issue. I've, I've been pretty lucky. But mm-hmm. um, I have a lot of respect for AppBrain. So anything that they really come out with, I generally always check out. And uh, they've got a really nice UI. If you're watching the video version, it's sort of this more flat, sort of new new modern look that a lot of Android apps that... It's sort clean of, and minimalist. Yeah. But yeah, uh, yeah. It looks it looks like it's easy to navigate. Minimalist is a great way to put it. Yeah, because yeah. it's, not, it's not unattractive, but it's not a lot of fluff and yeah. bouncing around graphics. So. So there you go, and I will. Uh, if you're watching live, I will put a link in the chat room to that right now. If you'd like to go grab that app, brain ad detector. I it's from Swiss Code Monkeys. I I don't know. Let's see. Is it in the actual? Uh, I don't know if it's in the Google Play Market or not, since it's from App Brain. But uh, might not be. It might. It might yeah, I don't know. You could, I'm sure easy it's easy to install either way. Yeah. All right, Matt, now uh, our desktop app pick this week comes from a new favorite you found. Yeah, actually. Uh, for myself personally, when I'm first getting up of a day, I usually like to have my coffee pot on standby. <laughs> if I am, in fact, drinking coffee, which, to be honest, I'm trying to cut back. but that's You're a morning story. zombie, aren't I'm you? I'm a morning zombie, so <laughs> I have a variety of caffeine routines. But one of the things I tend to forget to do is I'm always forgetting to turn on my computer. And that means I have to sit there and wait for it to boot. And I know nowadays it's not that big a deal, but wouldn't it be cool? If you knew at a certain time your computer is just going to turn itself on from a cold start. Like the coffee machine. Like the coffee machine. I'm not talking <laughs> about from standby. I mean from it is turned off and it's going to come on. There, We found it. I have actually found an app that will not only turn it on for you, but allow you to set the schedules to when it comes on and uh, give you complete control of it. I love the name because it's a play on Wake on Land. Yeah. It's called Wake on Plan. Yeah. It's exactly what it is. It's the plan is to, you know, for me to wake so, up and get in front of my computer. And does it do this with a GUI? Because It does, know. and it not only does it with a GUI, but it's very easy to use. Oh, um, okay. And there's a second link in the uh, show notes Oh, is there, there? Yeah, and it'll actually give you, it uh, should be. Okay, no, I'll find it. You keep talking about it. So what do you use Anyway, it for? so yeah, you go ahead and click that, and you go ahead and click into that and get the GUI up. But basically, it's going to prevent you with a little G, uh, G2K interface, and you can set up your, either based on uh, two different types of, uh, you know, setup options as far as setting up. I usually set it up for... Based on a specific time oh, okay. versus uh, anything, you got the graphic. It almost kind of looks like a bit of a cron schedule. It, 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 well, so. I think it's you know, it's if it was running uh, jobs, it's essentially what it would be. But basically, it's working with the power management system, and uh, will actually turn your computer on at the set schedule. I've tested it numerous times; it works flawlessly. And if you're interested, you must have to have some level of BIOS support for this. I would assume uh, it did. Now, the only the only support issue I ran into is if you are oh, running okay. a computer on your battery, like say a laptop oh, or something sure, like sure. that. If that is disconnected from power. It's not going to work. He says here the AC it just requires uh, ACPI spec yeah. uh, revision one, which, it, which is published is back old, in ninety so. six. Yeah, so, so you're probably okay as yeah. long as you're not connected to battery yeah, only. You're you should probably be fine. Right. Yeah, so it's pretty cool and it's worth checking out. And I'll, if you're interested, if you want, I will also include another app that will turn your computer off at a certain time. <laughs> You should make that next week's pick. I think, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's really not enough to do on its own because it's That's so funny. basic, but it's yeah. kind of cool. You yeah. Know? Well, hey, man, you can't go lower than Nano. I yeah. think Nano was a pick once. Yeah. So. No, that's go. great. Yeah, you do that. You bubble I, it with some uh, cron jobs. And I don't you're know good if I use that so yeah. much for like uh, getting up in the morning, but it would be nice like if I know I'm going to be home like at 4 o'clock from a client, why not have the machine boot up at 345 350. If you're running DVR functions, if you're running uh, or something like that, or if yeah. you're running uh, something to maybe you uh, just have a computer that you need to do some cron stuff with, right? You, know, you just need it to boot up and take care of it and then boot it, so, you know, turn itself off. You're good to go. All right, Matt. Cool. Well, that's an awesome one. So it's called mm-hmm. Wake on Plan, and we, we have a link plan. to that in the show notes. So you guys can go check that out if you'd like. Now, the uh, app, or I'm sorry, the distro pick this week is one that uh, not only was flagged yes. on our Reddit, but it was also flagged on Slashdot. So probably a lot of you saw this one. Undoubtedly. But I, I think it's got to get some attention, and I think we'll probably give it some more attention in the future. Mm-hmm. And that is Banjero Linux. Manjaro. I like how you say that. Manjaro. Kind of got the R roll going on there. Now, what cool. is Manjaro? <laughs> Uh, Manjaro Linux is uh, Arch for Noobs, and it is the uh, all holy promised, super easy to use Arch Linux setup. It comes uh, with a nice, look at this, nice, they got a nice GNOME desktop here with mm-hmm. Firefox out of the box, so you're not doing the whole build from scratch Arch thing, uh, and it, it's, um, 
it's supposedly, from what I read, 100% compatible with stock, straight-up art. That's, so that's what I've read. Mix- and, I, and I've also read that some of the videos floating around, it shows the installer. That A lot of the videos that are showing the installer, it's actually the alternative installer that's being shown. There is, in fact, a GUI, GUI installer. installer. Yeah, there is. Yeah, yeah this one shows so, the alternative. Yeah. yeah. Um, so a GUI installer for Arch it throws you into a very nice-looking GNOME 3 mm-hmm. desktop, and uh, I believe it's GNOME 3. Maybe I believe it is GNOME 3. Uh, it might be. Maybe it's no, not. No, no, no. Chat room it the chat room it's XFCE, they okay, say. Okay, there it is. It's there okay. And uh, so you heard, you read somewhere, though, that it might be using slightly older packages. I, we had a discussion in, in the subreddit, and there were not only some alternatives uh, to this particular distro pointed out, but one of the things that was coming up is that it, while it is, it's Arch, it's using some older stuff in the, you know, okay. to, to run with. And I don't know. I've, like I said, I haven't explored that, but that was one thing that came up. Okay. So, But it still looks really cool, and it looks like a really sweet way to kind of get your Arch on. Yeah, and if it, even to, if, uh, it is, even if it is a little bit of the, you know, if it's older stuff, if it's 100% Arch uh, compatible, it seems like, you know, you just swing over right. to the main mainline AUR repos. And well, and one of the points that the folks have brought to us say, but you're missing the complete point of Arch. What's the point of doing Arch if it's not difficult? And my argument to that is that if you could, if <laughs> I you just could, want to play with the new apps, yeah, man. it's like it's like honestly, I, I think that with any Linux distribution, if you can get their feet wet first, it's a little bit like getting into a cold pool. Get them wet with it mm-hmm. first. Get them get get their feet get their feet in there. Once they get used to it, then they can try Arch proper and get really into it. Jumping into sure, the deep sure, end yeah. for a lot of folks that that's based on time or experience can be very. You know, so non-compatible. Here was where so, the confusion was. Yeah. They, like you might expect, which sounds pretty cool, is mm-hmm. they have a KDE spin, a GNOME spin, yeah. and an XFCE lots of, spin. Lots of options. I think as as our you and I have a ton of content in the pipeline, mm-hmm. but uh, as a spot uh, opens up and maybe we can move stuff around, we should try it. We should kick the tires I think on so. This I think and so. And do a review because yeah. this sounds interesting. And uh, I, I, the reason why I don't, don't jump into Arch is I I I move around a lot. I need to. Yeah. I need. I need the flexibility. Like my. If I'm going to invest my skill set into a distribution, I need the ability to replicate that distribution fast. Like today, right. uh, or I mean last, sorry, Saturday, I needed to set up a fast Ubuntu install. Now, I need to, if, if, I, if Arch is going to be my main distro that I run on my, all my machines, I need to be able to set up Arch in 15, 20 minutes. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And see, for me, I don't have that issue so much as, and Arch may actually solve this for me, is what keeps me on Ubuntu more than anything is the PPAs. I can find software new for anything. Well, and that's and, supposed and, to be a, and, you know, and so if Arch is addressing that, which it sounds yeah. like it is, it sounds like it's just cutting edge. Then potentially for myself, because I don't move around so much, that might be an option. But I've really, I've been pretty happy with where I'm at. So for yeah. I've not had a lot of need to go exploring. The, uh, I so, think you know Arch might yeah. specifically solve a solution like you, where you want you know you want a mm. lot of stuff in the repository and you yeah. want the fresh versions. That's something they 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 sort of are like. I, I think the PPAs is. Ubuntu tried to graft a solution on mm-hmm. top of their, yeah. you know, app system, and, and it's well, hackish. It works, it's hackish. but it's yeah. yeah. As it grows, it starts to become. And we've talked about why PPA manager just to try to manage that. And that's and that's the downside of uh, the way Ubuntu does it is that it can get really messy yeah. really quick, especially when one PPA breaks and you you get to track down which one that is. Yeah, yeah that's always fun. Yeah. So yeah, I think Arch is definitely worth looking into if you want to uh, explore Linux. Deeper. Or uh, Manjaro. Or Manjaro. Check out Manjaro and let us know what yeah. you think. Yeah. All right, Matt. Well, let's do the news. So, what's new in the news? Great question, Matt. Our top story in the news docket this week. Happy birthday, Linux. You're now 21. Oh, my gosh. You know, it's all, it's almost old enough to take out to a bar and just get completely hammered. Oh, Matt, you couldn't resist. I, could, I, I was debating on whether to go with that, but, <laughs> you know, got to be me. Well, so uh, this, is, this is a landmark that we like to uh, pay attention to every year on the big show. And uh, so let's and, – and like we've often done, uh, this is, this is uh, just – I know nothing new, but come on, nah. this, come on! This 21. is my one chance a year to do this. Yeah. Uh, so here is uh, Linus's original post to uh, post. the uh, comp.os.minix news group. Uh, Hello, everybody out there using Minix. I'm doing a free operating system, just a hobby, won't be big and professional like GNU, for 386, 486 AT clones. This has been brewing since April, and it's starting to get ready. I'd like to get any feedback on things people like dislike in Minix, as my OS resembles it somewhat. He says in parentheses, same physical layout of the file system due to practical reasons, among other things. <laughs> Boy, double parentheses there. Uh, I've currently ported Bash 1.08 and GCC 1.40, and things seem to work. This implies that I'll get something practical within a few months, and I'd like to know what features most people would want. Any suggestions are welcome, but I won't promise I'll implement them. Smiley face. 
Uh, P.S. Yes, it's free of any Minix code, and it was a mul- uh, and it has a multi-threaded file system. Uh, it is not portable. It uses 386 task switching, etc., and it probably never never will support anything other than AT hard disk. That's all I have. That sounds incredible. Can I get that on Windows? <laughs> oh, whoop, did I go there? Oh, <laughs> so with that, awesome. uh, that there you go. That was the very. Uh, That's a real kind of a trip back in time, isn't it? To just a simpler time to when uh, you know, yeah, it's kind of cool. And as I said before, you can take Linux out drinking now. Yeah. So, so uh, congratulations. Cool. All right, Matt. Big deal. Let's yeah. move along. Something now, uh, now something interesting to look at. Twenty-one years later, is mm-hmm. Linux is relevant as hell. Oh, yeah. As this story from TechCrunch uh, points out, Twitter is joining the Linux Foundation, which I did not see coming. That is crazy. Well, they, as they should, considering their they should. Uh, so but I, I didn't see it coming though. I, I was really really surprised by that. Linux just, found, Foundation joking. member bigwigs include IBM, Intel, Google, HP, mm-hmm. and Oracle as a raft of other names, right. of course, you'd recognize. Uh, this will be announced uh, this coming week at, uh, at, at, uh, That's cool. at Linux Foundation's Linux Conference. Good for Twitter. Yeah. Uh, also uh, joining up this coming week is In- Ink Tank, a company that provides development and support uh, for uh, a distributed file system, and nice. Severgy, manufacturers of assi- efficient power architecture-based enterprise-class Linux machines. Servergy. Servergy? Servergy. I'm sure it must Servergy. be Servergy. It's got to be Servergy. Yeah. It sounds a little better than Sever. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. Uh, so uh, great for Twitter doing that. I'm not, I didn't glean from the article, you know, there's different, there's different uh, membership levels, but mm-hmm. traditionally, once you sign up, you continue on a yearly basis to contribute that amount. So That's an ongoing revenue generation. Mm-hmm. So uh, Like an auto debit kind and of And then that money yeah. goes towards things like conferences, paying mm-hmm. Linus's paycheck, paying people around him, mm-hmm. and uh, keeping a lot of important projects financed, managing a lot of things that somebody would like, you know, a, like a corporation would do for a product that they sell, only they do it These for- These things take money. They do it, and then they're financed from companies that use the product. It's a very, it's a very awesome model. All right. Well, Samsung and Apple have made a lot of headlines this week, but I don't want to talk about that on the Linux Action Show. I'd rather avoid it. It, it doesn't really apply to Linux, and uh, I don't think it's done. I'm, I, I've kind of been done to death with it. To yeah, and I, I think so. there's, I think it's hyper covered out there, and uh, the, the, the obvious repeal process is going. I mean, the repeal process is obviously going to begin, and that's just going to. Stretch it out. Well, I'll give you the quick backstory. Uh, they, uh, the two companies went through the tunnel of love. Uh, they ended up in a fist fight, and now they're angry at each other. Well, so that's that's about the. the great that's see, all you need to know. The chat room. The chat room supports our decision. So, uh, but before we completely move away from Samsung, let's talk about uh, this post that OS News is Tom uh, says uh, effectively means Tizen and Bada are dead. Hmm. Uh, now, uh, the focus of Samsung. This is from uh, this is from uh, Samsung's. Uh, 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 a Samsung mobile report that uh, came out, I guess, just recently. The focus of Samsung is in the second half of 2012 is fully focusing on Windows Phone 8 and Android. Because Windows Phone market is in the hands of Nokia, they will try to get that chair back as, as you know, as whatever they can do to do so. Uh, Samsung will also try to make their Android position better than before, thanks to new, some, some new Galaxy products in the second half of 2012. However, the sad announcement is Samsung has moved their first Tizen OS devices to 2013. Um, and uh, the last time uh, somebody read through the lines like this, so Tizen was going to be their Linux based mm-hmm. free operating system. Right. That was my um, understanding. And Bada is as well. Mm-hmm. What Tom is, what, and, I, and the reason why I focused on the stories, because I, I kind of agree with them, is this is essentially them putting it out to pasture. What they're doing is yeah. they're, they're, go, they're, they're, they're dipping into Windows Phone 8. Yeah, that's where they're that's and, where they're putting their time. And to be honest, yeah. not that I have any intention of using it myself. Technically, Windows Phone eight, although it just completely tosses out the previous OS, yeah. has some very interesting technical achievements in it. So I could see Samsung developing some pretty badass phones bu- built around that OS. Now, would you want that OS? No. Uh, I but what I, I guess yeah. my point is is I see them focusing on that platform and pulling away from this other stuff. I agree with them pulling away from this other stuff, but honestly, we live in an Android iOS world. Everything else is just fruitcakes. I, eh, you know, I so I I I, 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 th- I honestly think you look that, at the position that Microsoft, the the giant, is in. Yeah, I, I mean, for me, and yeah. they can't get in. So how yeah. is Tizen? I mean, how is Mego? Competing in the phone market, it shouldn't be that complicated. You take the operating system that you can, in fact, work with, which is going to be Android. Then you do something, oh, I don't know, different and unique with it that everyone else isn't doing. Again, it shouldn't be rocket science. Whatever they're failing to do, do that. Release it. Profit. Well, look what Samsung I mean, did. Samsung on. focused on build size. quality and larger screens. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's a start. And it's a great because start. Because what, what people love about the iPhone is build quality, one okay. of the things. 
Yeah, but a lot true. of people think the phone is too small or the screen is too small. It's way too small. So if you can if you can if you can maintain good build quality and maybe even include features like replaceable battery, that would be huge. And, you know, and, and a sixteen by nine aspect ratio. I think I don't know if the iPhone sixteen by nine. And anyways, uh, that was a competitive advantage they had over mm-hmm. the iPhone, and now they're into the number two phone sales. If they can innovate without getting sued out of exi- is, uh, existence, then I'm all for it. And I think that's really what they need yeah. to do is they need to find a way to differentiate so, themselves. Tizen is so. probably going on the back burner, and I don't think it's necessarily a bad decision no, as much as. I hate it. And I think the community, I think it, what it really is going to come down to is an open source operating system driven by the community, not driven by Samsung, not driven by Nokia. And I would love for that to be open mm. web OS. Yeah. I would love cool. to just, let's let's get the hell behind web, open web OS. It's been in the market. It's got some devices that people can get on now to at least do early development testing. That mm-hmm. has huge value. It's got a lot more maturity than some of these other fly-by-night type deals. Um, I just, yeah, And it has a good reputation. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I just think we need to focus because we really need to get in this fight. Uh, because even if we're ever just going to have a platform for the geeks to use, even if it's just going to be for for the eccentrics that want yeah. a free phone that you know is <laughs> they have to pay full price for, right, and exactly. you know maybe they have to do a a, a, yeah. a prepaid contract, whatever it is. If we even want to be in that game, we've got to move soon. Yeah. And, and it needs to focus. be a unified yeah. uh, operating system, yeah. like you were saying. So uh, yeah, I think WebOS is where it's at, but I don't see that happening, unfortunately. All right, so, so let's move to uh, uh, some uh, more focused Linux news yeah. here. Okay. Uh, Canonical is promoting the Ubuntu Software Center to smart. game developers. Smart, know, smart, right? smart, 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 smart. Uh, so this is on the heels of the Unity 4.0 game engine gaining native Linux support mm-hmm. via some mono magic. Um, and Canonical is sponsoring a session at this week's Unite Game Development Conference to promote the Ubuntu Software Center to game developers. Mm. Uh, and they've also done; they're also doing some sessions. Uh, they're right. going to do a session at the Unite 2012 conference in Amsterdam entitled "Ubuntu Software Center Published to Millions of Linux Users mm. with Unity 4.0." And then they immediately do this, and we don't mean desktop Unity; we mean the 3D Unity. Branding fail. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and the problem is, is despite what Canonical might want to no think, good. that Unity is more known than their Unity. Now, maybe not in our community, maybe not in the Linux landscape, yeah. but in the in the world of gen. And the, and and the problem is, is y- the Unity game engine is is just growing. Like I, I've had conversations with potential clients, and they've heard of Unity. Like it's made mm-hmm. it down to like people in businesses that decide, okay, we need an app, and we want to use Unity. Yeah. Uh, so that's the kind of penetration we're talking about, and and literally, like even Canonical's own blog where they announced they're doing this, they have to make the disclaimer. And by the way, we don't mean our desktop Unity. We mean whoever came out first won, and they should have realized this when they were. Yeah, I. Yeah, the, the whole it's a branding fail, and it's going to have to be addressed. And at some point, they're going to have to either add a word or subtract a letter or something to differentiate that. It's going to be a mess. Uh, before we get into the weeds uh-huh. of a big change is coming to Arch Linux, let's bang through just some quick distro news yes. announcements. Just yes, quick, yes, stuff. Yes. quick stuff. Quick uh, stuff. First up on the radar, uh, Fedora 18 delayed one week. Not a big deal. Mm-hmm. No. Blaming on some bugs, well, and they want to fix them first. Two things. Two quick things on that. First okay. of all, all right. No, if you got juice, no. no I mean, f- first, thing, a lot of people juice, have been really been uh, upset about this delay, and honestly. If it means that they're getting the uh, the release out that's stable, that's good. Yeah, uh, are Ubuntu, 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 well, yeah, Ubuntu people could learn from this, as far as I'm concerned, because oh. instead, instead of being on time, make sure it's not hey, crapping oh. out on people. I'm just throwing that out yeah. there. So yeah. good for Fedora. All good. right, there you go. Well said, yeah. Matt. All right, uh, just a quick news because I know we have a lot of Linux Mint fans in the mm-hmm. audience. Keep you guys updated. Linux Mint 14 has been announced. It's going to be called Nadia, I believe. Nadia. Nadia. Sounds right. And uh, it should be out at the end of November. It's going to have uh, the Cinnamon version, the Mate version, a KDE mm-hmm. version, and an XFCE edition. Lots of choices. Good yep. for them. So Linux Mint 14, end of November. Cool. And one quick announcement, since we don't ever give them the love they deserve, PC Linux OS KDE 2012 Desktop Edition has been released. Now, PC Linux OS has primarily transitioned to a rolling distribution. However, every now and then they cut off one of these. Here's a good release point. Uh Let's make an announcement because yeah. these rolling distros also struggle from a lack of publicity since they don't ever have a big shiny announcement. Exactly. Anyways, go check it out. It features the uh, latest and greatest KDE uh, 483 kernel 3218 with, of course, the PC uh, Linux OS uh, patches with 
maximum desktop performance patches. Well, and I would also point out if you're a new Linux user and you're finding that you're having compatibility issues with things that are based on Ubuntu, to check these guys out. Oh, yeah. It is really surprising just how compatible this uh, release yeah, tends to this be. Yeah, this isn't an Ubuntu spin. No, no, this is not. This is an RPM baby. Yeah. But it does a nice job and it tends to uh, have some pretty solid compatibility. I'd check it out. And it's out of the box cool. support for proprietary drivers yeah. if you want them, wireless, mini codecs, Works, things uh, like with that. With wireless, it actually outperforms a lot of other distributions, I'd say. So it's pretty good. Check it All out. All right, Matt, let's cool. get into the weeds. Are you ready? Weeds. So a yes. story we elected to sit on last week just to kind of yes. see where it went was the uh, probable announcement that Arch Linux would be moving to SystemD. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, boy. I remember this. Oh, boy. So we decided to wait to see if uh, any more things uh, sort of percolated to the surface, and they have over the following week. And we've actually gotten some posts from some Arch developers. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, right now, SystemD is an optional init system you can get for Arch Linux. And the Arch Linux developers are attempting to maintain compatibility with the traditional system and SystemD. And sometimes that leads to people not properly testing and then right. things getting pushed. And they, 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 this kind of led to this big conversation is, are we just going to switch to SystemD or what? Now, SystemD is a new init system that uh, other distributions like OpenSUSE, mm -hmm. uh, Fedora are using. It was developed by uh, Linar Linart. I believe so. Sorry, I want to get Leonard Pottering on the show, and I don't want to butcher his name when I want to get him on the show. Yeah. Developer of Pulse Audio, as, as well as a lot of other great technologies, employee of Red Hat. Oh, well, I didn't know that. This That's is a cool. Red Hat developed okay. project. And uh, so it's already got some cross-distro support, though. Mm -hmm. Now, notably missing from that list, I'd say, would be Ubuntu, yes. who uses the Upstart system. Uh, yes. I believe, right? Upstart. I, I believe it yeah. is Upstart. Yeah. And uh, they've developed that, and they think it's great, and they don't really seem to have any interest in SystemD. Mm -hmm. uh, so the... Not only is it sort of reached sort of some backlash because it's change and people don't like change. No, no, they do not. The other, the other flaw that I would say System D kind of has is it's for me as not mm. being completely familiar with it is it kind of has like a magic black box approach. Uh, you know, the traditional system is all Bash script based. I can go in there and I can look at things and you I can, can see what's going on, comment sure. stuff out if I or whatever it is, mm -hmm. right? And I, I, I understand that. Yeah. Um, now that's not to say that I won't learn System D, but System D is it is got has does have a lot of advantages. A bit of a learning curve, even. Uh, yeah. So uh, the uh, Tom Tom Gun. So I don't know. Uh, yeah. Arch developer from France. So I'm. Yeah, I'm, we're not even gonna. Yeah. We'll just, uh, he he outlined a few benefits. Uh, number zero, Matt. Mm. It's hot plug capable. So System System D assumes all resources may appear and disappear at any time. So external hard okay. drives and things like that are actually very easy to that manage. That sounds cool. Uh, yeah. Benefit number one, we can know the state of the system. System D keeps track of all daemons, all processes that are started, and who owns all of that and when something fails. Okay? Benefits sound pretty good so far. Number two, it's modular. All of what is now in rc.systemInit is split out into many independent services, each of which is well-documented and easy to understand. Number three, it allows for Dbus, Udev, to go back to doing the task they are meant to do, both UDEV and DBUS have currently been misused to start demons and uh, uh, and uh, long-running services on demand. Boy, that text is small, isn't it? Yeah, it is pretty small. There we go. All right. There we uh, go. So uh, let's go back down to benefits. So uh, benefit number four. We can reduce the number of explicit orders, uh, ordering dependencies between demons. This mm. might require changes to demons in question. So this is one of the issues. Okay. Is, okay. okay. So system D is incredibly good at parallel starting. Sounds and like And it's it. incredibly mm. good at determining dependencies and mm -hmm. avoiding things. Uh, like, okay. Let's back up. So say you want to start MySQL and Apache. Makes sense. You can't right. do that until the networking stack has started, right? So System D knows this. So System D can start the networking stack, and then if MySQL and Apache can start simultaneously, it will start them at the same time. If MySQL needs to needs something open, like a, some port open from some service or something Apache's got, mm -hmm. it can start that first. But what it can also do is something like uh, Zynet used to do, or however it was. System, it can open it can open the socket and mm -hmm. listen for a connection, and then when the connection is made. It can then, on demand, start the service at that oh. point and make the connection. Now, the reason why that's a really great idea is because if other things are starting up that need services to be there, and all they're doing mm -hmm. is a port check just to see if that other service is there, it will, it'll answer that port check, and it allows other things to start up that otherwise would wait around for no reason. Well, these benefits sound fantastic. I can't understand why other <laughs> distributions are not wanting to... Well, uh, Upstart does you know? something kind of similar. Right, but is it doing it better? This sounds really compelling This is, I would say, system. the other advantage SystemD has is mm. once Arch implements it, you have Arch, Fedora, 
uh, you have uh, uh, okay. uh, OpenSUSE, CentOS slash Red Hat Enterprise Linux will all be eventually using this. Yeah, it sounds like um, the majority of the big boys. And the mm. the uh, the uh, the sort of the way it's able to communicate with other other services is also very advanced and very nice. So it it, huh. it seems like it seems like uh, for speed purposes and for you know compatibility purposes. It is. It does make a lot of sense for Arch to move this direction. Yeah, it makes a lot and, of sense and, for a lot of folks. And it lets the maintainers only have to only have to target one init system. They don't have to write, you know, and, and patch their their software yeah. for both. And it just sounds more efficient. I, I yeah. This is a no brainer. Uh, it also has security and sandboxing features that just kind of what he calls come for free with it, which right. you otherwise have to build in there. Uh, uh, System D, uh, like he points out here in his post, cross distro mm. project. Every major and many many minor distros uh, are contributing to System D, which is Obviously, very good. Uh, and and the last one here is System D is fast. Now, Lenart will point out that because it can start a whole bunch of stuff at once, mm-hmm. some of that speed trade off is lost because you're you're really thrashing the disk. Okay. But when you throw well, that on an SSD, he says the SSD because it's more randomized. The SSD right. is actually really good at handling that, well, yes. and it flies on an SSD. So but it's on, about equivalent on a spinning disk. And when you move okay. to SSD, it's really noticeable. It's okay. Speed. So, but it's still usable on a on a on a regular hard drive. So it's not like if you don't have SSD, you're still going <laughs> to get some benefits. Yeah, I. I, I think it's something that I think it's something to watch. It'll be interesting to see how the adoption goes and uh, oh my what gosh. the reception's going to be. Look at so. this. So from the chat room, Blackout Twenty Three okay. says he gets a two point eight second boot on his SSD with System D because you can already use System Seriously. D in Arch if you want. Uh, and like uh, Darth Giganu points wow. out, uh, you can't uh, make a cake without breaking a few eggs. True. And true. everybody loves cake, Matt. And I like breaking eggs. Yeah. Uh, so. so there has been some backlash. It's an interesting story, and it's something you can start tracking now. The post I've linked to. He also outlines ways you can kind of prepare your system. And and by the way, he also mentions timing. Mm-hmm. He says, we don't mm-hmm. have a date for this switch yet. We have a lot, We have a list of blockers that have to be resolved first. Okay. And so right now it's when it's ready and as soon as possible. But they have to have other things fixed. So this isn't, this isn't a change that's coming to Arch Linux immediately. Right. But as an end user, I believe your end result will be the way you start and stop your services and the way you configure them to start and stop at boot up well, for you, will be different. It sounds like it'd be simplified, really. Possibly. I, I, I think overall, I think once all the bugs are worked out, I Some think people definitely... think the current system is simpler because it's. It, they're also going to move some functions out of sort of that central RC comp file. And, right. Uh, you know, moving away from Bash. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's. I, when I say simpler, I, I think it's going to be more efficient at least. And I think simpler down the road. It may not and, be simpler at first. And not that there's not already momentum, but just as a follow-up story, uh, Debian is also testing a system D to... System D to System V and NIT converter, mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. and Debian's also considering looking into System D. So if you had Debian jump on board with this as well, that would be a major push, and that may be the push to get uh, Ubuntu and some of the others. Yeah, so, um, cool. Now, interestingly enough, and Lenart is perfectly upfront about this because mm-hmm. uh, there's a video that there's a video on YouTube where you can watch his whole presentation on System D and why it's incredible. Right, and it is it is a great video if you're into this. He points out that uh, a lot of these ideas came from uh, uh, the, the later implementation in Mac OS X of their new boot in its system. He said that we looked at what they did there, and we said we just saw a lot of lo- logical decisions because they looked at it from a more modern perspective and said, well, now that we can do all these things, what mm-hmm. if we did it like this? And it's not, a, it's not a one-to-one copy, but it's definitely, he said, inspired from that. That's interesting. Well, yeah. you know, and if they're doing something right and they want to duplicate that, I say more power to them. All right, Matt. All right. Well, that's all the news for this week. All right, joining us on the line is Thomas A. Knight, who has been involved with a project recently to help out one of our own fellow geeks, right, Matt? That's correct. He's actually been working closely with Ken Starks, who you might know through his work through the Linux community. Yeah. Uh, Thomas, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So, Thomas, can you kind of uh, sum up what's happened in the last couple of weeks uh, for people who don't know the backstory and all of that? Yeah, um, so uh, most people know Ken Starks from his work with the um, Helios project, uh, which is now called Reglue. Um, he's a, a great guy. He refurbishes PCs, gives them to kids who need them, whose families can't afford them. And uh, it turns out that uh, Ken has been fighting cancer for uh, probably about six months. And uh, if I'm right, he fought it once before this too. Um, 
recently there was a bit of a turnaround in his case where uh, he thought he had the cancer beat and they did a PET scan and found live cancer cells not just in his larynx but also in his right lymph node. Um, wow. Right around this time, uh, you know, they, they dropped that news on him that, uh, you know, the cancer is not only still alive but it's spreading. Mm -hmm. um, SSI, the, his Social Security also drops on him that he now makes too much money to um, oh, to get his insurance that was covering his treatment before. Oh wow! So now he has he required surgery to uh, take out his larynx and his right lymph node to prevent the spread of the cancer even further, and uh, no insurance to cover it. Um, Very difficult. Yeah. I, I, so how did the idea to do an Indiegogo fund kind of come around? Yeah. Ken wrote a blog post about uh, the troubles that he was having, and um, I, I saw the blog post. I've worked with Ken a few times, and uh, actually a portion of my royalties for my books go to Reglue as well. So I, I've been supporting Ken for a little while um, in, in his quest here, and when I saw that, I mean, it, it, I, I'm Canadian, so we have, uh, like, government-covered health care through our taxes. <laughs> right, it, right. It just... I was awestruck that the U.S. government could let somebody, you know, as generous as this and somebody who's done so many good things for the world, right, right. Uh, basically leave them out in the cold with no treatment option. Um, the, the surgery was looking like it was going to be very expensive. There was no way on earth that Ken was going to be able to afford it. And I, I knew that Ken wouldn't on his own go out to the community and ask for money. Right. Uh, I wrote a blog post that night. It was about 11.30 at night. When I read it, I wrote the blog post up uh, to see if I could drum up some funds to even to help Ken with the new monitor because the, the one of the side effects from his treatment was that he can't look at devices with backlight. It oh, makes geez. him sick. Yeah, okay. So, you know, I set out three goals for myself, and I, I originally thought I would only accomplish the first. Uh, which was, uh, the first was to get him a, an edge-lit monitor. Mm. Which has happened, I believe. I believe he's got the new monitor. Yeah, he's got the new monitor now. Uh, the the second was um, to cover his medication costs, mm -hmm. and the third was to try to pay for the surgery. Right, right. And I actually heard from uh, heard from Ken yesterday, and he sounds like he is satisfied with everything uh, as far uh, monetarily that he's uh, going to be able to work with the doctor that he's been able to locate, and uh, yeah. that this yeah, is, is going to come to a successful. Is it key, uh, like a, a surgeon came through that can yeah. uh, do it at whatever Ken could uh, raise, and, the, and thanks to contributions from the community and the and the finding of this surgeon, he's this this looks like it's going to happen. Is are we correct? That's right. So yeah. Um, that's awesome. That's fantastic news. Twenty-five. I see twenty-five thousand dollars was raised on the Indiegogo. Well, and it's actually higher than that. Uh, and I don't know the specifics, and and Thomas can certainly elaborate on this. But from what I understand, it was it's actually much higher than that. Um, it, it's actually going to be enough to where it's going to uh, allow. That's what's allowing this to happen. Um, I guess there was some d a discrepancy in the numbers, and there's some confusion there. But um, but it sounds like it's. Uh, Is that anything you know the background on, Thomas? Yeah, there were. Uh, the original method of donation was uh, through my site. I set up a, a PayPal donate button. Oh, uh, yeah, sure. And, mm -hmm. um, that one, uh, Ken copied the code to his blog as well afterwards. Okay. And that was where uh, a large portion of the funding went in. That's where the ball got rolling? The yeah. campaign was set up the following day ah. um, by uh, our friend David Ray. And... Uh, we were included in on that uh, to help administrate, and uh, it was my uh, PayPal account that was used to collect the funds so that we could keep everything together. So the actual grand total that we raised was uh, almost fifty-one thousand dollars. Oh, that's, oh, so that's awesome. awesome! That's wow. fantastic! Wow, the community really came together for that. Yeah. Now, uh, so what happens next? Um, right now, uh, Ken and I have been talking about options to uh, to. First and foremost, get the money out of my account and into a fund yeah. that would be specifically for his medical bills. Mm -hmm. uh, that that's one of our biggest concerns right now is is that we don't want the money sitting around somewhere where someone's going to get nailed by the tax man and right. end up you know losing a bunch of it. So yeah, yeah. we want to try to find like a you know a nonprofit fund that we can say this is for medical expenses and that's what it was raised for. Okay. Um, wow. Some kind of a right trust now, or something. Yeah. Uh, Ken is uh, working closely with his doctors. Um, they're 
discussing treatment options. He's going to start a new medication regimen. It's going to slow the cancer down. And uh, this new surgeon, who is very kind to step up and, uh, and do this, uh, is lining up to do the surgery within, uh, I believe, Ken said, six to eight weeks. Wow. wow. Well, the Linux Action Show and the community really uh, all together is, is pulling for Ken. So, Absolutely. Thomas, will you keep us posted on how he does? Absolutely. All right. Well, thanks for, so much for coming on and uh, giving us the background on all this. <laughs> Cracker back. It's time to talk about Backtrack. That's no cracker jack. <laughs> Good job, Matt. All right, so backtrack isn't your father's distribution. This ain't, this ain't your grandpa's, it's not your aunt's distribution either. Backtrack is a security tool suite. Um, it's not really meant for running email, for browsing the yep. web, although it can do that. This isn't a distribution that's really designed to be a desktop not platform <laughs> or a server platform. Think of it as a toolbox. And uh, backtrack, I have used professionally. Uh, for years. Now, they've just recently released uh, version 5 R3. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, with the nature of Backtrack, is they're not really, it's not really necessary to do frequent updates. No, it's 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 the toolbox. It's it's like a real <clears throat> toolbox. You don't necessarily need to swap your tools out every time they come out with a right. new magic wrench. So. And uh, it is a distribution that excels at bundling tools that will do amazing things, which we'll go over here in just a second. Uh, a little bit of background on my end. Uh, for years, starting uh, in the early 2000s, I did security audits using tools that now come bundled with Backtrack. So Backtrack wow. was a big breakthrough for me because it was essentially everything I used in a single ISO image. Right? Oh, it's a real time saver. Yeah. yeah. Back in the okay. day, you know, Nessus was big and uh, uh, Metasploit, which is still great. All of these kinds of tools, things that can, tools that can, that are specifically designed to take advantage of flaws in Cisco routers or mm -hmm. monitor for types of traffic that HP printers will use or all these types oh. of very specialized tools that if you have access to someone's network can give you a great deal of information that you can then use to compromise the network. And so I would, I would through contracts, and completely legal, I mean, they would ask me to do this. A white hat approach. Yeah. Yes. The, so I basically go to the client and I would say, and this would either be through a company that contracted to me or when I contracted directly later in life mm -hmm. uh, or currently, um, They'll come to me and say, oh, do you want a vulnerability assessment or mm -hmm. do you want a penetration test? And these are actually two different things. A vulnerability assessment is a great report that tells you these things are wrong with your, with your network. And does that provide suggestions on what to do or is that do you no, uh, call up well, on I your do. own knowledge? Okay. I do. So then okay. I, write up, I write up suggestions and, and remedies. Okay. Now, penetration testing is I actually try to, try to take advantage of those findings and gain access to the network. Interesting. And that's what we're going to do today. Cool. All right, we got it down. And uh, now, uh, Backtrack uh, includes a ton of really, really, really great tools. In fact, check this out, Matt. Under the, this is the GNOME three edition, and and actually, this is this is one thing kind of worth mentioning. It's kind of neat. The Backtrack does mm -hmm. over at uh, Backtrack Linux.org, which is their website. When you go to their downloads page, mm -hmm. okay, you can they ask for your information. Although you don't actually have to do that. You it's can just, not mandatory. You just no. click download, yeah. and then you say what version do you want because. Actually, some versions have different versions of the tools. Like right. this Backtrack R3 release no longer has Nessus. Oh, okay. So and that, I love Nessus. So you definitely need to be able to select. You might the want to go you back. Want. A little yeah. Bit. But okay. so say you want to try the latest version, and then you say if you want GNOME or KDE, and then see it, it automatically changes the selections. If you choose GNOME, you can choose 30, 32 bit or 64, and then nice. if you want a VMware image or an ISO image, <laughs> if you want Direct or Torrent, the Torrent download is substantially faster oh, than the yeah, Direct download. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, and then you grab that, and, and it starts downloading for you. So that's kind of a, a unique way to get a Linux distro. Uh, once you're in Backtrack, mm -hmm. I chose the GNOME version here, okay. uh, look at the menu structure. It starts with information gathering, mm -hmm. and then all of the tools that take place in information gathering. And then you mm -hmm. can break it out. Then you go into information gathering network analysis. And you can see I can do DNS analysis. I can uh, identify hosts. I can do OS wow. fingerprinting. I can do route analysis to, to build a map of the network. I can do SMB analysis to, to crawl Samba servers and figure out what shares they have available and what rights they are. Oh, I great. can do SNMP analysis to monitor the SNMP traffic on the, on the line, figure out what models of switches I'm dealing with, perhaps even their operating mm -hmm. system version, mm -hmm. and then determine what exploits are available for those. List of tools. And that's just in one menu. Then you have vulnerability assessment assessment, and you have various vulnerability scanners, network assessments. You have exploit tools that take advantage of known exploits. Here's ones just for Cisco, right? Now, Mike, this is all to monitor and exploit yourself. Clients and banks want this stuff done mm -hmm. so they can protect from attackers because these are the tools that attackers use. So you need to use the same tools to find your vulnerability. And having this all in one place is just such a tremendous, it's awesome. tremendous it's, thing. It's awesome. Yeah. Uh, wireless escalation tools, to mm -hmm. even Bluetooth, GSM. Uh, uh, oh, wireless. even has Bluetooth. No, oh, that's yeah. oh, okay. GSM, well, that's if you cool. got the chip. Right. Uh, so, anyways, I could go on and on maintaining right. access. Sure. Come on. Let's take a look at one of my favorite tools. It's called. Uh, it's from this, this interface. At least is from Greenbone. It's called okay. Open Vulnerability Assessment Tool. 
and it, Let's check it out. This is where I found the bug in Backtrack. Um, oh. Oh, you did find a bug. Okay. Yeah, there's in Backtrack R35, there's supposed to be a setup guide that okay. will set all this up for you because right. this vulnerability scanning tool I'm about to show you requires about three back-end pieces to be running mm -hmm. and because sure. uh, you have dedicated management daemon, you have a dedicated scanning daemon, you have plugins you have to update, you have SSL certificates you have to generate. And oh, okay. this right. script they are supposed to include is supposed to automatically set all this up for you for and the prompts. And it didn't run. Oh. So you, I found a guide, which I've linked in the show notes, will step you step by step on how to set it up manually so it does work. So you can still make it happen. Yeah. And now here's a question. If you went to an older version of Backtrack, this would then be resolved because the bug wouldn't be an issue. I would assume. Yeah. Because the... Yeah, I would assume, but assume I, I'm so. not yeah. sure. Okay. Uh, so once it's installed, it is uh, it has either a GTK front end or a web mm -hmm. front end, and then you can you can issue tasks against machines on your network to scan them for all the potential vulnerabilities. Uh -huh. Now this has a plugins database, mm -hmm. so it's current with all of the CVE releases and all of the alerts, all of the That's cert cool. alerts that come out, and it knows about those vulnerabilities. Oh, nice. And it essentially has ID tags, so it knows how to talk to a host and and query it in a way to determine if it has a potential potential vulnerability. Nice. And one of the fun things you can do is if you want to play with these vulnerability scanners mm -hmm. and see what really happens when yeah. you have a system. So check it out. Okay, so let's, Matt, let's see the sucker here's, now. Here's two examples. You see I have two machines listed here in the list of machines that I've scanned. I one is machines. called Last Scanner okay. and it found uh, high threat vulnerabilities, right? And one's called XP Scan and it has low threat vulnerabilities. Okay. So this one's kind of boring. Let's just take a quick look at this. You can see that it went through and it found 22 low or I'm sorry, seven low vulnerabilities that really aren't even worth mentioning. I could generate a PDF report and if put I them in a to. log file. It looks yeah. like and all that. For and you. I cool. have over here on on the machine you're sitting at, I have uh, two VMs running. One of them is uh, hit that XP one. So that's the XP one I scanned. Okay. I set this up as like, this is your typical accountant's computer. It's got yep. QuickBooks on it. It's got Internet Explorer. Mm -hmm. It has all of the patches, all of the updates, and it actually fared fairly well. Hmm. Now, Matt, okay. click that other VM. You've all got right, there. let's click it. Now, that Ooh. VM there is called Metasploitable. And this VM is designed to have all kinds of vulnerabilities in it. Oh, it, so it's a test. Uh, it, they did yeah. things like there's a version of uh, VST, uh, v, uh, VSFTP daemon on there, mm -hmm. a, a much beloved, much deployed uh, version of an FTP server that for a very short period of time, somebody slipped a Trojan into the code. And a few wow. distributions deployed it into their distribution. Oh, wow. This ships intentionally with a vulnerable version, sort of as a what-if scenario. And and you could also use this uh, distribution then actually to uh, make sure your software is set up correctly. Yeah, well, so for example, so, so then I so I okay. scanned the vulnerable system. So let's go back and scan the metasploitable yeah. one, the called last scanner. As you can see, it has a high threat ratio here. So I go here. Oh, it's going to lock you out. Well, that's good. Scary, it does. Yeah. It does lock you out. This, mm -hmm. I'll tell you, I, this web interface is actually pretty nice. Yeah, I would prefer this, I think, over uh, going. The GTK app felt a little slow in this yeah. web. It little, sounds little weird, quicker. but this web interface is actually a little quicker. Yeah. So now mm -hmm. we're looking at my last scanner, and you can see it found 27 high vulnerabilities. Okay. 12 medium and 23 low, and then 41 that it just has notes about. And I can generate these very comprehensive PDF reports that I oh. could almost turn around to a client. They're very technical. But it's but it's nice to have something granular. And you can also generate yeah. out HTML, CPE, LaTeX. Mm -hmm. Uh, text, oh, XML. Wow. So you, you can really. So I, what I do is I generate out and then mm. I massage it into an easier to read report. Sure. But when you scroll down, you'll see that it found uh, a port summary. It found a disk CC. Mm -hmm. It found mm -hmm. FTP, HTTP, Microsoft Directory Services. MySQL is running, and it says oh. all of these so far have a high threat level. <laughs> they all have vulnerabilities, even SSH. And it found a medium threat with SMTP. And then I scroll down, and it actually breaks things out. I can see my disk CC. Uh, disk CC is a program to distribute builds of C and C plus mm plus. -hmm. Well, this okay. particular version has a vulnerability. It's uh, here's the uh, vulnerability number. You can go get more information. Here's what it can do. You can scroll down. Here's another vulnerability that's found with Pro FTP. Here's the information. Wow. Here's the fix. You see, it's giving me all this information this about is these tremendous. Right? I mean, this is just absolutely incredible. I love the fact that it and it and it, and it really lays it out for you in easy to digest bites. Yes, and and then mm -hmm. and it lays out in uh, order of severity. So as I scroll down the list, okay. things that are less severe, you see the colors change, and now we're getting to medium severity. Oh, man. TCP sequence number approximation reset denial of service vulnerability. And I get all the CVE information about it. I can see the different cert posts on it. IBM's mm -hmm. got a post on it. Microsoft, Cisco. Very, very information packed. And this is all information that I can turn around right. and, and you know, value add to my clients. Exactly. And, you know, translate yeah. with these things because they don't know what they Oh, no, yeah. You have to have that person in between to and actually put this in English. it's all free and open source. <laughs> now... <laughs> Wow. If I'm an attacker, let's just start. Let's just start with things easy. So uh, if I'm an attacker, I've run this assessment, and I see, mm -hmm. 
oh, well, hey, look at this map. They've got, got uh, some options and opportunities They've got here. a dis- yeah. CC detection uh, mm. uh, little vulnerability here. Well, that's when I take advantage of another tool that comes bundled with Backtrack called Metasploit. Oh, Metasploit, yeah. so where Nessus is a vulnerability scanner, and it detects vulnerabilities almost like a virus scanner would, mm-hmm. but not really because it's doing probing and things like that. Right. Metasploit is we know about all those vulnerabilities. Mm-hmm. Now, here's a bunch of scripts. You you replace the variables, and we have prepackaged actual executable payloads that will execute against oh, these man. systems and actually get, in some cases, root access. I've used it as a test mm-hmm. without ever having administrative access. I was able to create a new folder on the desktop of the administrator account on one of their domain controllers right. by using and this the, And this tool. is the same tool, someone that is malicious, that is right. not, not uh, right. there to help you, could definitely use against you. So and, that's good to know about. And here's a GUI called Armitage. I, I, oh. I don't know exactly how you pronounce it, but this yeah. sits on top of Metasploit. And you see I have a Metasploit, con- I have consoles here. Metasploit has an entire command line. So you could all do it through SSH if you want to. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I, I have gone through and I've identified two hosts on my network that I want to try uh, different attacks against. So here's the okay. uh, here's the here's the metasploitable oh, box. Right click attack. I right mean, click it attack. It doesn't get any uh, simpler. Than and that. then uh, let's go down now. I remember wow. there was that discc issue, right? So look, here's a discc exec. Oh man. So it fills in all the variables. It sees the remote host. It's going to do. Uh, it'll do remote wow. OS detection to know which particular version of it. And I just tell right. it to launch, right? Oh man. So. Now, down in my console, you'll see something here. It says, exploit running background job. So starting starting reverse. reverse handler. And this is my own IP here. Oh, man. Command shell session to <laughs> open. So what it has done is Metasploit has opened a Telnet server on my end, oh. executed remote code on the remote host, and then connected back to my Telnet session. So now I can write. You see now, and also the icon changed to lightning bolts. Yeah, it's, like, it's yeah. like it's frying yeah. the penguin. Or and now I can right click on it and look at this shell. Oh, Interact, and goodness. now I literally have shell Access. on that oh, box over there. Oh my gosh! And I can do, you know, and I can begin to do privilege. And if 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 the service I if the service that I compromise is running as root, I now have root level access. So it's Whoa. really awesome. Yeah, and, un- unless you're on the receiving end of this. I mean, that's wow. <laughs> yeah. So and these Ooh. are tools that there's tons of guides online, yeah. and and honestly, you guys, I could I could spend six months worth of shows covering all these tools. It's a yeah. fantastic tool to play with. It's fun just to scan your own systems mm-hmm. and then see what you can do. However, be careful what you're scanning because some of these scans do sometimes accidentally trip the vulnerability. I've done oh, scans yeah. where like yeah. IIS is, you, you know, you, you sometimes, depending on what kind of scan yeah. you can do and you can tweak the, the scanner intensity, I might crash IIS, something mm-hmm. like that. Uh, but if you want to play with some of these tools, I've got links to guides and uh, more information about them in the show notes. Backtrack Very can cool. be downloaded as an ISO or a VM image, and you can just play with it. It's based on uh, an older version of Ubuntu. Uh, mm-hmm. And, you, and you, the thing I would recommend is grab the VM image because then you have right access to the file system and you can do updates. And they have repos for some of these tools, and they've provided updated versions of them. I didn't see a fix for that, uh, for that open VAS uh, setup script would let you do all the vulnerability scanning. But the link I provide in the show notes... We'll show you guys how to do yeah, it. I think it's worth checking out. Backtrack is an awesome tool. I totally love it. And it's one we also mention all the time on TechSnap. So and remember to use it responsibly. If you love these type of topics, go check out TechSnap because mm-hmm. we cover this stuff constantly. Definitely. That all right. awesome. There you go. That's the Linux Action Show's look at Backtrack 5 R3. Woo. And that brings us to the end of this week's broadcast. Now, before we go on, I want to say thank you to System76 for sponsoring our last Backtrack segment there. Huge thank you. We were plowing through that and didn't get a chance to say it then, but I want to say it now. I love System76, been an owner of their systems for years, and if you want an integrated solution that's just trouble-free, it's designed and built to run Linux, System76 is the way to go. They actually sent us their Wild Dog performance PC. I love this thing because you can throw a ton of tasks at it. It doesn't make a stink about it. It runs nice and quiet and keeps up with you. And it's just a great system that you know is going to run Linux exactly. great. Not a sound out of it. And more importantly, uh, with each Ubuntu release, it's going to work. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I'll tell you this, System76, if you ever release an Ultrabook, you've got another customer right here. Just saying. He's serious. Uh, so uh, thank you, System76. Go check out their PCs for a hassle-free system that, by the way, they contribute back to Linux, too. So it's great to support a awesome company guys. that does that. Awesome, guys. Now, Matt, before we get out of here for the day, why don't we cover some feedback? All right, let's cover some feedback. We got a new show idea that was sent in. Now, it was submitted to the Reddit, and then he deleted his account, so we can't give him credit. But I still want to say thank you. He says, hi, Chris and Matt. Doing a killer job. Love the distro reviews. Love the how-to segments. Mm-hmm. But I'd like to propose, take a CLI distro like Gen mm-hmm. 2 or Arch and install it in the show. You can fast-forward the simple bits, then take a step mm-hmm. further, install X, basic functionality programs, fast-forward again, and then talk about big options. 
like a, maybe like different iTunes replacements sure. before you install them. Fast forward again, install that, and then you have a package. Uh, that would be a full show. That would. That now, would be a very full show. A long time ago, I did actually do an Arch install mm-hmm. on the show. You can probably find that in the RSS feeds. Uh, here's the thing. Okay. That actually, not that we're not ever going to do that, that kind of chopping and then fast forwarding and chopping and, and stopping at the good bits where we mm-hmm. talk and then fast forward and chopping again until we get to the good bits. If you think about from a practical standpoint, editing wise, the editor, which is me, yeah. has to watch it. And then when we get to the point I want to cut out, I cut it. And then I watch again to make sure the cut's good. And then I play again. I watch it. And then I stop and I cut. Mm-hmm. And I watch again. So you end up watching it three or four times. So to make a 45-minute segment, which would be very long for this show, mm-hmm. you might be talking two, two and a half, three hours of work, which Easy. would put this show way out late, which then people wouldn't be able to download it for their morning commutes, which is always our goal. While that doesn't mean we're not going to do it, we might do it as either a supplement to the show at some point. And or that would be cool. If, if there was ever an opportunity to record it ahead of time and then cut it, and we might do something like that. However, we're going to take elements of his ideas and see what we can incorporate. Yeah, we'll see what we can come up with. But logistically, it's a little bit of work. Yeah. This show, too, I've always and the comments pointed this out. You know, we always we we don't we don't we know you have a limited amount of time, and it's a long mm-hmm. show as it is. So a lot of times, if we can walk away and pique your interest and inspire you to research even further, that's even almost better than anything we could do directly. More timely sometimes. And yeah. we just we just try to find the balance between how far we need to take it to make that happen, or if it's something where we need to go all the way. Right. And and it's it's sort of like a it's like a back and forth thing. Yeah, definitely. All right, quick question came in from Pierre in the uh, Linux subreddit. He says, "I have a quick oh. question on converting." Podcast? Can somebody point me to a question. web service that was mentioned a few times on last for converting, for converting podcasts to other formats prior to downloading? Mm-hmm. Now I did answer his question, and he he still was kind of confused. Uh, so the um, oh, I closed it, Matt. I closed. Oh no, oh, I didn't. Oh, oh, the oh, site oh, I recommended a long time ago, and it might have been on the faux show actually, was okay. keepvid.net. Keepvid.net. Okay. And what you do is you supply it with a YouTube video. Does it, he was thinking you take the links from our website? You don't. You supply it with a YouTube video URL, and then it's a little Java app. Let's say you got to have Java working in your browser, right. and then it will run through and it will expose all of the different formats that YouTube encodes. That oh. You never really get to choose from. It exposes all of those to the user. Well, so that's kind of handy. Everything from a 240p 3GP file and wow. FLV files up to 480p MP4s, which would work on a on a mm-hmm. device, even WebM. So WebM 360p, nice. WebM 720p. So if you want to grab it from YouTube and get it yeah. in WebM, you can use this link and it will generate a WebM link for you and then download. That's it from not YouTube. bad at all. Yeah. So I think I think that's what he was thinking about, and that's keepvid.net, and you just supply it with the YouTube URL, have Java working on your system, and then it will let you down. That's also just a great way to archive really good YouTube videos. It de- definitely is. Yeah. Especially if you're concerned it's going to be taken down, or maybe yeah. the account's going to move on to yeah. something else. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, uh, two last things before we get out of here. A long time ago, I made it the distro pick of the week, uh, and that's Brian2040 in the chat room. Brian with an I, because mm-hmm. he's an American. He's working on a distribution called Descent OS. Okay. And he's just hit an important milestone, the release candidate. Oh. And the neat thing about Descent OS is Brian, from the very inception, has been working in the jblive.tv chat room. Well, that's cool. And okay. so it's really been something that the show has been able to kind of watch, a little bit from a distance, but watch go from from the, the evolution of it yeah. yeah and this is a very nice distribution that he's he spent a lot of time making a very pragmatic practical distro that uses the traditional desktop conventions but mm-hmm. feels modern gnome 2 users would be very much at home people who like FSEC, xfce but mm-hmm. maybe want something a little more descent os might be a great way to go and what i would like to do is brian 2040 has been working with the irc chat room and people have tried it out for him and he's gotten some people on board to test it Oh, that's interesting. You I would, he's gotten some feedback there. I would love, that. though, yeah. to open this up to the to the wider Linux Action Show audience, mm-hmm. the download audience, the, the, the very big audience, and get some of you to go give him some last-minute testing on his RC release. Let's make Descent OS a really fantastic release. Be awesome. Because as, as somebody who's... It's a small project, but he's really going for quality, and I don't want... Once he reaches 1.0, I would hate to see people download it and find bugs and think that oh, yeah. it's, you know, it's not prime time Especially ready. Especially if it's avoidable. So let's yeah. help him out. Let's show him yeah. the last Linux Action Show. Last love. The last love. Let's go check out Descent OS, descentos.org or a link in the chat room. Brian2040, who is awesome and he's always in there talking about his distro. Let's help out one of yeah, our community I'm members. Check that out when I get their, home. How cool is it one of our very own last audience members yeah. is making a distro? And we've had a few of them do it, but he's really close to such a huge moment. Let's help him out. This is awesome. Yeah. Let's get on that. All right. So I will, and I will put a link in the live chat room to his uh, RC announcement, which I also have a link okay. to in the show notes. Uh, cool. One last thing. I know we're running a little long, but uh, our. I uh, just want to say, uh, yeah. rest in peace to Neil Armstrong, who passed away yesterday at the age of 82. Mm. Uh, obviously, first man to walk on the moon. And uh, it's inspired generations, and will continue to do so. He will uh, be so, missed. Well, he will be missed, and uh, I'm sure we'll be talking about 
his legacy on uh, this week's side bite if you want to tune in and talk about that with us so matt anything you want to plug before we get out of here i just wanted to let folks know if they want to see what i'm up to they can always uh visit me at datamation.com and check out the open source channel and of course i'm also looking to take on additional writing gigs or consulting gigs uh, you can check me out at matthartley.com mm-hmm. backslash resume oh very nice and he's also got links to his google plus profile yep. in the show notes too where he's very active and my mm-hmm. links to my google plus and twitter accounts to both of us can be found in the show notes yeah uh the jupiter signal if you are not subscribed to our monthly newsletter at jupiter broadcast we only send out once a month and we don't spam you yeah. and uh, one of the things I did a write up on some behind the scenes information on Unfilter which cool. is uh, kind of like uh, one of the secret ingredients to the show and we've also got a couple announcements we'll be making in there so you can go to bit.ly slash Jupiter Signal and sign up for that if uh, you like that. alright everyone well thanks so much for tuning to this week's episode of the Linux Action Show and we'll be right back here next week Hello, welcome to the Skype call testing service. Boom, two behind backtrack. Boom, behind a bunch. Boom, 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 crash. <laughs> <laughs> Caffeine. <laughs>